Welcome to Kid News Combos. I'm Tori. Today, we're having a conversation about the 2024 presidential election results. After months of campaigning, analyzing, and unseen twists and turns, the election is now over. It was a stunning, historic political comeback for Donald Trump. To discuss the results, what comes next, and how kids can get involved in politics, I'm joined today by Mark Curtis, who currently serves as the chief political reporter for the Next Star Broadcasting Group and has covered 10 presidential campaigns. Mark and I were former colleagues at KTVU in San Francisco, and he is also on the board of directors for Kid News. Mark, thank you so much for being here. I know it's been a crazy week for you. Victoria, you're very welcome. And it's been a long time since we've spoken. And I can tell you this was actually my 12th presidential campaign because I got to cover parts of it this time, too. And I got to meet Bobby Kennedy Jr. when he was uh, running and I interviewed him. And so I always get my fingerprints on this. Okay, well, that's that's excellent. And and there literally there's no one else I'd rather talk to on this topic. And you have such good common sense, unbiased take on things. So so we've I've got a lot of questions for you. So let's just dive right in. And Tell me, what did you think about election night? Were you surprised? And why were the polls so wrong? I had, you know, I was surprised by the margins. And I I had predicted that Donald Trump would get reelected, but he would by only one state, and that state being Pennsylvania, which is a state I cover their politics. And in uh, so I'm surprised that he also took Wisconsin, which is my home state in Michigan, uh, that blue wall that was the upper Midwest, as they called it, all went for Trump. I, I still can't explain why completely, but I've got a few hunches. And why do they call it the blue wall? And, and what are your hunches for why Trump won? Well, the blue wall is a consistent group of states that usually votes Democratic. And those states are Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin. And Democrats for years carried all three, with a few exceptions here and there, you know, Ronald Reagan and and some others. But those are three of the most reliably blue states in this country for Democrats. A lot of union labor in those three states. And so it's very powerful. Now, my hunches on this, uh, the main one is Donald Trump, his organization has a really good ground strategy. They don't just go knocking on doors in urban areas. They had a real solid strategy to go knock on doors in the less populated rural parts of the state. And there's there's a lot of scientific uh, academic data that shows that if a candidate or a candidate surrogates knock on somebody's door, shake their hand and ask for their vote, that that's way more powerful than even all the TV commercials. And I suspect Harris had her ground game centered in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Lancaster and Harrisburg, the urban areas, Erie. And um, Trump got out there and beat Beat her by uh, beating the bushes in the rural parts of the state and getting uh, voters who felt long forgot. And the polls were wrong again because they kept saying it was going to be a dead heat. It was going to be super close. It might be a few days before, you know, we know the final results. And then we knew them in, in about 12 hours. Well, it's interesting. Polls, and and I'm going to give a little math lesson to our students listening, polls have a thing called a margin of error. So uh, you hear that when the the, the kids are familiar with it because they hear it on the newscasts all the time. So if a poll says Trump 50 percent, Harris 49 percent, and then the commentator says the poll has a margin of error or plus or minus 3 percent, that means Trump could actually be at 53 percent and Harris at 47 percent. And so I think that margin of error thing factors in because he did win by a bigger margin than most polls predicted. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, we often ignore the margin of error. And and polls are also, they're just a snapshot in time with really a, a small group of people, right? Well, polls are based on what's known as a sample. And a sample is a group of people in the population that get asked the question. A lot of these polls are only three, four hundred, five hundred people that get called and they try to project um, the views of 500 people across the entire nation. There's a thing called bias in polling. And here's the main part of it. Um, not everybody has a cell phone. Most polls are conducted by telephone. Not everybody has a landline in their home anymore. And a lot of people don't have cell phones. Who are those people that don't have landlines and cell phones? They tend to be poorer people, people with less means and less money. And so they don't get polled. Nobody ever calls them and asks them a question about they're going to vote for Paris or Trump. They just don't get the phone call. And so the polls are skewed a little bit where it's not really representative of the entire United States. 
Uh, you may have a lot of people that make over $80,000 a year get polled, but people under $40,000 don't ever get asked at all. And that's why sometimes polls are wrong. Yeah, the boy, the polls were clearly wrong this time. So, Mark, what, what issues do you think resonated the most with voters? Most elections, the biggest issue is the economy. And uh, I know our students have heard the word inflation, inflation, inflation over the last year of these campaigns and the commercial. Let me just try to explain it in the simplest terms. If you go to the lunch counter and you buy a lunch item at school and it's a dollar today, and then you go back tomorrow and it's a dollar 10 cents, well, that's a 10% increase. That's an inflation of 10%. Um, if your mom and dad goes to the fill up the car with gas and today it's three dollars and tomorrow it's three dollars and thirty cents again that's ten percent inflation the reason the economy is so important to people is because most of us spend a great deal of our money on groceries and on transportation and it's something that uh, you know i think that they probably hear their parents you know complaining about the price of things going up and oftentimes it's when the price goes up really fast and really sharp so you know money matters to people and it matters when you get to the voting booth Talk a little bit about the historical context. This is the first time since 1892 that uh, a president has won a second non-consecutive term, I think is the right way to say it. It was President Grover Cleveland. He was elected in 1884. He was voted out of office in 1888. And he circled back in 1892 and he won again. Of course, they didn't have term limits back then as we do now, but it's the only, that was the first time in history a president served non-consecutive terms. And now Donald Trump will be the second president to serve non-consecutive terms. But he can't run for re-election again in four years, right? He can't run again. And that might be a problem for you, uh, for him. They call it a lame duck when you can't run again. Um, lame duck is what they call you because the people in the House of Representatives and the people in the U.S. Senate have no allegiance to you. They don't have to uh, vote for something that might be unpopular back home just to help the president. Uh, they can kind of go their own way and vote their own conscience. It's hard for the president to put pressure on them because they got to run for office again. He can't. Now, it, it wasn't just the White House at stake in this election. Another big matter is control of Congress. Republicans have regained control of the Senate, and the House of Representatives at this moment is too close to call. So what does this mean for the president-elect's agenda? Well, let me first take the U.S. Senate, because the U.S. Senate, and not the House, just the Senate, has sole responsibility to confirm all presidential appointments, whether they be Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense, and all judicial appointments like justices to the Supreme Court and all federal judges. That helps President Trump a lot. In his first term, he appointed three justices to the U.S. Supreme Court, and he had a Republican majority in, in the Senate, which he later lost. But he got all three justices across the finish line. Now there's a possibility he could have at least two more appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court because a couple of the justices that were appointed by Republicans are getting older. They might have stayed, dug in their heels if Harris had won. But now that President Trump will be going back to Washington, we may see a couple of Supreme Court appointments in the Senate, which is right now going to be 53 Republicans, 43 Democrats and independents. Um, they have enough votes to get whatever judge or justice President Trump wants in office. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of power. And what's at stake when it comes to the control of the House, which, as I mentioned, at, as of this recording, is still too, too close to call. But it's looking like the Republicans might retain control of that chamber. The one unique thing about the House, okay, so the, the Senate has sole power over appoint, appointments. The House is where all financial bills tax bills must originate. You can't originate them in the Senate. So if he wants to get more tax cuts, and he's talking about that, if he has a House that's controlled by Democrats, they may not ever get a tax cut out of committee. If the Republicans take over, there's a good chance there could be some more tax cuts or other financial things. So that's the uniqueness of the House. Each branch of government, each part of the government has what we call checks and balances, things where they can that the, only they can do that others can't. And it's a very interesting system because it keeps, you know, it's a three-way playing field between the president of the two houses of Congress and the Supreme Court and the federal court system. So, you know, things can be done by Congress and then they can be undone by the courts. And so it's, again, they call this checks and balances. So not one person or body can come in and have their way and do everything they want without any opposition. 
So speaking of the court system, this is kind of a a tough issue to discuss, but some kids may be curious about why Trump could even run for the second term. You know, some people are surprised a convicted felon was able to be elected to the White House. And just a reminder, Trump was found guilty on 34 counts of falsifying business records, which is a felony in New York. So can you explain, Mark, why he was allowed to run? Well, first of all, in the U.S. Constitution, there's nothing that prevents a a convicted felon from running for federal office and being elected president. There's nothing there. And people say, well, yeah, he was convicted, though. Why can he still go? Well, there's nothing that prevents him. And then in fairness, in the legal world, we have a a thing called an appeal, where if you're found guilty, you can appeal to the next highest court. If you lose there, you can appeal to your Supreme Court. So as part of due process, yes, a person is innocent until proven guilty. But then, yes, he was proven guilty. But that's subject to appeal. And obviously, for uh, a majority of voters, it wasn't an important issue because they they still voted for uh, Mr. Trump and and he's now headed back to the White House. So what's going to happen? Because he still has some other legal cases pending, correct? Yes, the federal uh, cases pending uh, in terms of uh, about election interference in 2020 and some things he and his team may have done. That's a federal case. And then also uh, the actions that may he may or may not have been involved with on January 6th during the insurrection and the riots at the Capitol. Those are federal cases. And it's my understanding that the things are in the works to just drop those cases uh, at the Justice Department and not prosecute them any further. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Mark will give a very clear explanation about the Electoral College, also the perception of bias in the media, and what kids can do to get involved. I'll be right back with more of Kid News Convos and political reporter Mark Curtis after this short break. Today's Kid News Convos episode is brought to you in part by a generous donation from the Nicholas B. Ottaway Foundation, committed to improving communities and impacting lives through three unique philanthropic efforts focused on education, journalism, and community impact. We are grateful for their support and the support of all our generous donors. We're back with Kid News Convos. I'm Tori, having a conversation with Mark Curtis, political reporter with Nexstar Broadcasting Group. Mark is based in West Virginia. And Mark, I know the Electoral College, is it's it's pretty complicated, uh, where the president is decided by who gets to the number of at least 270. So is there a way to give mm, kind of a simple explanation about why states are assigned a certain number? Every state gets two electoral votes, for each U.S. Senator. So that equalizes everything. So California has two U.S. Senators. Here in the tiny state of West Virginia, we have two U.S. Senators. But every state gets another electoral vote for every single member of the House of Representatives in their state. California, I believe, believe has 52 members of the U.S. House. Here in West Virginia, we only have two members of the U.S. House. So we have four total electoral votes in the state, whereas California has 54 electoral votes. It's based a lot on population. Mostly it's based on population. So if I win the state of California by just one vote, and I'm Kamala Harris, I get all 54 electoral votes. It's winner take all in just about every state. And I I know the students hear this, it's possible to get the most raw votes, the most number of popular votes, but still lose the Electoral College. We've seen that happen a number of times in our lifetimes. And and, but what's interesting is that this is the first time Trump has won both the Electoral College and the popular vote. It's a very good point. Back in uh, 2016, Hillary Clinton won the most popular votes in the country, but he won the most electoral votes. Last time around, Joe Biden did both. He got the most popular votes and the most electoral votes. And here we go again, where this time President Trump gets the most popular votes and the most electoral votes. Like I say, it's only happened you know, three or four times in our lifetime where it, it, it didn't sync up and one person actually got the most votes, but they didn't become president. There, there was a lot of criticism about the about the press uh, and the coverage of this. You know, some pundits saying mainstream media, you know, was 
not giving fair, unbiased coverage of all three candidates who were part of this, first Biden, then Harris and Trump. Do you think that's true? And and remind kids about the importance of quality independent journalism in a, in a democracy. Well, it's very important whether we're in local media or national media or internet media or television to be fair, to give both sides an opportunity to say their piece, to be objective, which means to stay out of it. I don't ever go on the television and say, I, Mark Curtis, encourage you to vote for Donald Trump or you should vote for Kamala Harris. That's completely wrong. We don't do that. We're supposed to be even handed, not take sides. And so I, I think that's important. A lot of times, though, the bias is in the eye of the beholder. If I'm a, a very um, you know, conservative Republican and I hear something on, say, MSNBC, which tends to have a more liter liberal editorial stance, I might say, oh, that's bias. They're against Trump. And, you know, a lot of people, um, their, their views on the media are based on their own beliefs. And if they hear something or see something that clashes with their own beliefs, they're going to yell bias. It's not always true. Huh. Okay. So speaking of bias and divided points of view, some people are really excited about President-elect Trump's victory, and some people are really concerned about it. President Biden addressed this issue and the need to heal the other day after the election when he said in the Rose Garden, I think it was, you can't love your country only if you win, and you can't love your neighbor only if you agree. So Mark, can you touch on the difference in feelings that a lot of people have right now after this election? Yeah, you can go on social media and find equal amounts of both. Look, the thing I say is next year we will celebrate the 250th birth of this country, the 250th anniversary of the greatest democracy that has ever happened on planet Earth. And to the people that were on the losing side, I say, we're going to have another election in two years for Congress and, and in another four years for president. It has switched back and forth and back and forth in my lifetime. Um, and it's the changes in the House and the Senate, sometimes one party has the other. There is always hope in this country. There is always the goodness that we've lived 250 years with very disparaging, uh, d desperate points of view on a lot of a variety of issues. So to the young people out there, I say, look, there is hope. There's going to be another election down the road. If you don't like what happens in this presidency, you get the opportunity to change it down the road. And I think that's an important thing to remember in the democracy, because you're not always going to wind up on the winning side, as President Biden suggested. You know, you have to learn to accept defeat and figure out how do we do better next time. And you can't take victory and say, well, winner takes all. We get to do whatever we want. It doesn't work that way. As I mentioned earlier, we have checks and balances between the White House, the Congress, and the courts. You have to be gracious in defeat and um, be knowledgeable in victory that not everybody voted for you. And you have to think about their feelings and their issues and how they view the world, because you may be on the losing side of the next election. All presidential races are, are important and get a lot of attention, but this one especially so. So talk about how kids who are intrigued, you know, with this process, um, can they get involved in, in politics, you know, for the next one coming up in four years? It's a great question because I got in, I got involved in politics and news coverage at a very young age, sadly, because I was alive when President Kennedy was assassinated. And then I watched as a kindergartner the next year when Lyndon Johnson beat Barry Goldwater to become the president. And I've been hooked on stuff ever since. And yeah, I think that's a, you raise a good question. I think, number one, if you're just curious about it, watch it and learn about it. Number two, if you're thinking about running for public office someday and you're in the eighth grade Run for your student council at your school. Get involved. And it, because we're in a democracy, you know, we kind of sometimes look at the president and the senators and the House members as the people that change everything and make the policies. Look, we have the loudest voice with 300 million voters in this country. Get involved. Go to your school board meeting. Go to your city council meeting. Run for, you know, your school class president and get involved. Because if you don't get involved and you stand back and kind of look the other way, well, you know, then part of the blame falls on you for not getting involved. That's one of the beautiful things about, about a democracy and, uh, you know, being able to participate. Everyone has a, has a voice and an opportunity. All right. Well, Mark, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for taking part in it. And I always enjoy talking with you. Tori, thank you. And I look forward to being back on Kid News again. 
Oh, we'll definitely have you back again, Mark. And you can also find Mark's weekly column, The Sunday Political Brunch, published every Sunday at golocalprov.com. And thank you for listening to Kid News Convos. We'd love to hear what you think about this conversation and let us know if you have any ideas for future topics. Just drop us a line at wehearyou at kidnews.org. Have a great day.